We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark, and this morning we begin a new section and a new chapter, chapter 4, which begins uh, Mark's coverage of the Lord's <clears throat> teaching of parables. You find these same parables in Matthew 13, an uh, extended version of that, and a lot of the parables in the Gospel of Luke, but this is Mark's treatment of it. We're going to look at the first parable, which is lengthy. It's the first 20 verses of the chapter, so follow along, beginning with verse 1. He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and was saying to them in his teaching, listen to this, behold the sower went out to sow. The birds came and ate it up. Others, other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and they grew up and increased. They yielded a crop and produced thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. And he was saying, he who has ear, ears to hear, let him hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside get everything in parables so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the sons who are beside the road. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil and they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, 30, 60, and a hundredfold. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it. <clears throat> In 1795, the London Missionary Society was established and sent missionaries across the globe to places where the gospel had never been preached. The results were mixed. There was a great awakening in the Pacific Islands from Hawaii to Tahiti. Islanders begged for missionaries to be sent to them. But in other places, there was little response. A missionary in India said that he would often return from preaching with the words of Isaiah in his mouth, who hath believed our report? 
Why is that? Were the missionaries in Polynesia just better than those in Asia? How is it that a brother and sister can hear the same gospel from the same parent, but one believes it and the other doesn't? Is one sibling just smarter than the other? We have good news. We have, we have the best news. We have the message of salvation from sin and death and hell. It is free and forever. Shouldn't everybody want that? Should we be surprised that they don't? These are questions that Jesus answered in a story he told about a farmer who went out into his fields and planted seed. Behold, he said, the sower went out to sow. What happened when the seed fell on the ground explains what happens when you preach the gospel, when you give it to those around you. The results are mixed. That's important for us to know. This is an important story. It's one of a number of stories or parables Jesus tells in Mark chapter 4. Parables are stories or illustrations taken from nature or everyday life that explain a truth by way of analogy. In fact, the word parable is from the Greek word which means to put or cast beside, placing one thing next to another in order to make a comparison between them. The, the earth is filled with illustrations of heaven's truth. And the Lord was the master of finding them in everyday life and using them to give revelation. The revelation given in these parables of this chapter are parables that give revelation about the kingdom to come. He says that in verse 11. He was giving them the mystery of the kingdom of God. It's an important subject. It's a subject that the prophets of the Old Testament often preached and gave in their prophetic utterances. It looked forward to a day when the Messiah would come and establish His kingdom on the earth. And people were anticipating that. The people that the Lord spoke to were living in great anticipation of that great day. But the truth of these parables is not so much about the nature of the kingdom as it is about the manner of its establishment and the time of its manifestation. The prophets had explained the nature of the kingdom. It would be an earthly kingdom in which the Messiah reigned. Paradise lost would be paradise regained. The people knew that. They were looking forward to that. The Lord was giving mysteries, unknown truth. That's what a mystery is. It's something that has not yet been revealed, and He's giving that revelation. He explains that before the manifestation of the kingdom, there would be a period of sowing and growing. Following the crucifixion and burial and resurrection of the king and before his return, the intervening age would be characterized by preaching the gospel and expounding the word of God. This is the age in which Christ is gathering people gathering His elect, gathering citizens for that kingdom to come. The parables reveal that. They explain the nature of this present age, the work of God, the work of the devil, the importance of preaching the Word of God, and the reasons why people respond as they do to the Scriptures, to the Gospel. And this is the first parable of those that he gives, the parable of the soils, which is very important to understand. It's important to understand in order to understand the other parables. That's what Jesus said. His preaching occurred <clears throat> by the Sea of Galilee. The, the crowds were very large. In fact, they were so large that Jesus had to get into a boat. He sat down in the boat, and from that boat he taught all those people gathered on the shore. He had only 
just been accused, if you'll remember, of ministering by the power of Satan, being a minister of Satan. The spirit within him was that of the devil, not of the spirit of God, was the accusation. Now, he had easily disproven and dismissed that charge, and the crowds were unaffected by it. They had come in mass to hear him. They were not hostile, but still, they were largely unbelieving. And eventually, they would turn away from him. And Jesus knew that. He knew the nature of this crowd. He knew the nature of their heart. But at this point, they still came to him. So Jesus continued to teach them, only at this point, his teaching is different. He taught them in parables which are not always easy to understand. These wouldn't be. But Jesus had a purpose in that. He begins with this story about a farmer who went into his field to plant seed. Listen, he said. In other words, pay close attention to this. Hear it and learn. The sower went out to sow. And then in verses 14 through 20, Jesus explains the parable to the disciples. And that's probably a good place to begin our study of this parable with a brief explanation. The seed represents the gospel. The different kinds of ground that he describes on which the seed falls represents the human heart. And the plants that grow Picture the different responses that people have to the gospel. While Jesus described the things that, uh, that they would not completely understand, he describes these things in ways that they were very familiar. Israel was uh, an agrarian and pastoral society of farmers and shepherds. They had all seen farmers walk over their fields and throw out seed. This was a common experience. This is what Jesus would do. He would take a very common experience like that that people may not think much about and draw a great spiritual truth from it. Well, as farmers go out and sow their seed, they throw the seed out indiscriminately. They throw it everywhere. And some fall, some of the seed falls on hard ground, on a, a footpath that uh, is next to the field, some on rocky ground, some seed falls on thorny ground, but some on the good earth. The seed that fell on the road, the hard path that people walk on, couldn't sink into the ground. So it was trampled underfoot, or it was eaten by the birds before it could germinate. The second seed he speaks of that fell on shallow ground had limited growth. In Israel, the land is very rocky, particularly around Jerusalem. That's the case. There are outcroppings of limestone. And so when seed falls there, it, uh, it, it withers under the hot sun because the soil is shallow. It isn't deep enough for the seed to take root. A third portion of seed fell among the thorns and weeds, and it began to grow, but before the sprout could grow fully, so did the thorns and choked the plants. It was the seed that fell on the good ground that grew up. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, the story applied directly to the crowd that was listening to the Lord, but it applies to us as well. It applies to every church. It is about the Word of God symbolized by the seed. The point is, just as seed is often unfruitful, so too the gospel is often rejected, but never completely. And where it is received, it is very productive. God cannot be frustrated in His work. And this word, as we've often said, is unique. 
It's alive. It's powerful. It's supernatural. When the Lord finished telling the parable, he said in verse 9, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning, receive instruction. Uh, Believe the instruction that's given and apply it. Well, no one seemed to have ears to hear because when he finished, his followers and the twelve began asking him about the parables. They, They didn't understand them. So the Lord said in verse 11, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, those who are outside get everything in parables. In other words, the purpose of the Lord's teaching is twofold. To reveal truth to the receptive, but conceal it to the unreceptive. People are responsible for the truth. Those who are not disposed toward believing it, who reject the revelation given to them, don't deserve to have more revelation. Those who believe receive it. Ultimately, they receive it by God's grace, and and that is indicated by the statement, to you it has been granted to know. In other words, it has been given freely to them. That's a work of grace. God has granted it to these people. But, But still, there is a human element in this. People are responsible to listen. People are responsible to believe, to respond to the light that they have been given. And when they do not do that, then light is withheld from them. All of this is the result of what took place previously when the Pharisees rejected the revelation of the Holy Spirit and called His miracles by the Spirit deeds of the devil. And so the Lord began teaching in parables in order to continue to give the disciples revelation while at the same time concealing it from others, from those in unbelief. It was a blessing for the disciples, but it was judgment on the nation. Jesus says that in verse 12 where He quotes Scripture from Isaiah 6. Those who are on the outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. This was originally the ministry that was given to Isaiah when he was sent by God to be a prophet to the people. His ministry, as you read Isaiah 6, is a peculiar ministry. His ministry was to harden their hearts, to make them unresponsive to the truth. Why is that? What kind of a ministry is that where one is sent out to harden the hearts of people? Well, it was a ministry of judgment. And it fit within a context, within a larger historical context. They as a nation had rejected the truth for centuries. God is long-suffering. God is a patient God. But there comes a point when that patience must run out. And that had happened with the nation. They possessed the law. They possessed it for centuries. They heard the prophets, many prophets, but they turned from the light to darkness. In fact, the book of Isaiah begins with uh, words of condemnation. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Brute beasts are more obedient than God's people, is what the prophet was saying. The animals knew their master, but Israel didn't. God's people didn't know because they rejected the truth that was given, and it had been given in abundance. This wasn't a lack of information. That wasn't a problem. It wasn't a lack of revelation. It was a problem of the heart. They willfully rejected Him by rejecting His revelation. So, they come to a point 
in Isaiah's time when they would be confirmed in and confined to their rejection and unbelief. That was Isaiah's generation. And that was what was happening in our Lord's time, in his generation. The, the problem had been repeated in his time, only it was much graver than in Isaiah's day. The Lord's generation had rejected God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. They'd seen that. He'd seen that in the response of the Pharisees to the miracles that had been given. And so revelation would be hidden from them so that they would be hardened in their unbelief. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. Now, those are the Lord's words. What that tells us is our response to the truth is serious. It's consequential. There's nothing more serious. There's nothing more serious than hearing the Word of God taught or preached or reading the Word of God, contemplating it. It requires a response that's serious. And so I guess we must ask ourselves, if, if it's not very serious to us, then perhaps that's a warning sign. In fact, I think it certainly is. At the same time, there, there was blessing in this judgment because by concealing the truth in parables, Jesus saved them from the guilt of rejecting even more truth and coming under even more severe judgment. So there's that aspect to this, but still, it was judgment. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, Hosea said. It's the consequence of unbelief. But the disciples who understood very little were still believing. And they would continue to have light. And after telling them how important this parable is, that, that they uh, would not understand the other parables if they didn't understand this parable of the soils, he then explains it to them. He says in verse 14, the sower sows the word. The seed is the word of God and the sower is the evangelist who spreads the gospel wherever he or she goes. Uh, you are the sower when you are at home or at work, when you visit family and friends and you talk to them about Christ and salvation, when you spread the good news wherever and however you do that. And the soil represents the heart. It represents the mind of those who hear the gospel. The condition of the heart determines whether it is receptive to the Word of God, just as the condition of the soil determines whether the seed will germinate and grow. The, the soil on, uh, of the road where the bird snatched it up is the unreceptive heart. Some people are completely unwilling to hear the gospel. They are the mocker of the book of Proverbs. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That is the natural man. And maybe since Christ mentions this first, that is the most common response. They don't want to receive it, so they suppress it. That's certainly what the Pharisees did. It brings conviction, and, and they don't want to hear that. They, they don't want to experience that sense of conviction of their sin. Men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. And that's why they respond as they do. They want to hold on to those evil deeds, and they don't want the light to tell them that they are that. In the Lord's situation, as I said, the, the Pharisees responded in this way. They, they saw the clear work of the Spirit of God. There was no debate, no real discussion that was legitimate about what the power that the Lord was exercising was, what the origin of that was. It was the Spirit of God working through Him and 
seeing that very clearly, they nevertheless rejected it, in fact blasphemed by saying it's the work of Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But it's not always uh, a, a patently hostile response that we get from the world. More than once the response that I've gotten is just a blank stare. The, 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 the look that says, what planet did you drop in from? Not, not any understanding and not the slightest bit of interest. In fact, I have one particular person in mind. I can remember his look. He's got a glass of wine and he's just staring at me like he didn't know what I was talking about, which he didn't. I, I mentioned Christopher Hitchens last week, I think, um, who was an aggressive evangelistic atheist. He'd written a book on the subject. The title was God is Not Great and got a lot of press coverage and media attention from it. And about a year before he died, in an interview that I saw with him, he confessed that the Bible was just so much white noise to him. Now, he hears it, it just doesn't make any sense to him. And he admitted that. Well, that, that is hard soil, which is a hard heart. A man without ears to hear. And the devil ensures that such people stay that way. There's a, a supernatural element in all of this. Like a bird eating the seed from a hard path, the devil quickly comes and he snatches that gospel away, that seed that's been sown. The Lord doesn't say how he does that, but there are ways in which the devil has that he can distract a person, he can get his or her mind off what he or she has just heard and fill the mind with other things that are more important sports, business, whatever, you name it, it can come in and suddenly they're off that subject and have no interest in it. The second soil, the rocky soil, represents the shallow heart. Verse 16, in a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. There are people in churches who meet this description. You may have met some. You may have had experience with them. There, there is an initial response. They get excited. They go to Bible study. They even begin witnessing for Christ. But it doesn't last. The excitement wears off. Feelings are valid, but emotion and faith are not the same thing. Emotions run out. Faith doesn't. So when a, a person is galvanized, is motivated by feelings or a, a false superficial understanding of Christianity, it doesn't last. Hardship happens. Reality sets in. And he quits. In his autobiography, Charles Spurgeon recounted his early ministry in the village of Water Beach and wrote of a man there that he said, caused me many bitter tears. He was young, he was tall, he was strong, and the ringleader in all that was bad. He could drink more than any man for miles around. He would curse and swear and never knew a thought of fear, Spurgeon said. Then one Sunday he was in church. He listened. He confessed conversion and uh, showed a real outward change. He gave up drinking and swearing and began attending church regularly. He came forward at prayer meetings and gave public testimony to what had happened to him. He prayed in, in rough, rugged language, but with impassioned earnestness. He did hard work around the church and he, he helped out in the Lord's work in, in whatever way he could, in the simple ways that he could. 
I set him down as being a bright jewel in the Redeemer's crown, Spurgeon wrote. So it went for about nine months, and then the laughter and jeers of his old companions got to him. He came to the meetings less and less, and, and then not at all. He went back to the old life and the old ways. Before Spurgeon left the village to begin his ministry in London, he asked about the man. He heard nothing good. He had become worse than he was before. What had seemed to be a work of God's grace had, and, and made everyone rejoice left them all in the church in a state of confusion, he said. Well, what had happened? But it happens. John wrote of this in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. They went out from us, but were not really of us. That doesn't mean they changed churches. It means they, they, they left the light for the darkness, for a false gospel. They were not really of us. They had never been really of us. We thought they were, but whatever. The trials of life, the, the uh, attractions of the world, the the interest that the false teachers in that particular case gave to them, drew them away and separated them from what was really genuine and right. So this is not uncommon. The third heart is divided, a divided heart that is choked by the things of the world. It, it is represented in the soil infested with thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Well, these are very much like the previous ones who had a good beginning. Uh, the, the previous ones, it seems negative, and this one seems positive. And what I mean by that is persecution on the one hand causes people to drift away. Good things, uh, appealing things, the things of the world cause others to, dr to drift away. It shows a sign, uh, this individual or these individuals of interest in spiritual things. Uh, there's evidence of growth, again, like that previous example, but he or she is double-minded. His loyalties are divided between the things of God and the things of the world. And the allurements of life just prove to be too strong. He's overcome by them and eventually drawn away from the faith. It's the danger of materialism and happens the same way that thorns overtake a garden. They aren't cultivated. Nobody cultivates weeds. They don't need to. They grow naturally. They grow where the ground isn't cultivated, where it is unattended. And so it is with worldliness. This, this person isn't careful about his or her heart. And so it's overgrown with the cares of this life, the ambitions of the world. And it becomes cold to the things of God. Now, he doesn't lose his salvation. He never had it. The proof is in his life. He doesn't persevere. He doesn't continue in the faith. The saved persevere in faith. By grace. They only persevere by sovereign grace alone. But they persevere. Now all of this could be very discouraging for sowers, for people giving the gospel, three hearts that are like three types of soil and all bad, all unbelieving ultimately and fruitless. But finally, there is a good heart, just as there is good earth. It is an open heart that receives the word, that understands the gospel, that believes it and bears fruit in abundance. Jesus says they bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, how do you know 
that the ground is good? That's the question that you might want to ask. Well, I don't want to sow seed in bad ground, so how do I know what the good ground is? Well, we know it by the fruit that it produces. And so how do you know what a good heart is? Well, the same way, by the fruit it bears. In, in the saved, there will be results in faith and practice. We can't know what these are until it, the seed bears fruit. So we cast out the gospel, as it were, liberally, generally. And the results prove themselves. There will be perseverance in the good heart, continuance in faith. That is the evidence, the proof that a person is genuine, a child of God. The emphasis, though, is not on whether a person perseveres, but on the kind of person who perseveres. A good heart, one that is open to the word and believes, will persevere because it is good. It's not good because it believes and it bears fruit consistent with faith, any more than ground is, is good because it bears fruit. Bearing fruit doesn't make the ground good. The ground bears fruit because it's good. And a heart believes because it's good. And it's good because God in His grace has made it so. Why did Lydia have a believing heart when Paul came to Philippi and preached by the riverside to this small group of women? She'd never heard the gospel before. Why did it make sense to her? Why did she respond to it? Well, Luke gives the reason in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. First, it is God. He chooses from all eternity. He calls in time. And when He calls, He regenerates. And those who He regenerates, He preserves. It doesn't mean that there won't be failures and setbacks in the Christian life. The parable doesn't teach everything on a subject. And this parable isn't teaching perfectionism. We continue to sin and we can sin miserably and we can fall and stumble. And sometimes even look like these other kinds of soil that drift off. The Corinthians are a prime example of that. You read the book of Corinthians and it's one problem after another. It's one grave sin after another. It's, it's one warning after another. But as you read the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul begins chapter 1, verse 2, by calling them saints. Well, this is what a saint is, not a perfect person. A righteous sinner is what a saint is. We won't be perfect in this world. and We won't be perfect until we're glorified. Then we will be perfect. But God gives a new heart. And the new heart, the good heart, holds fast to the gospel. It is a believing heart. It bears fruit. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Faith being a fruit of God, a gift of God. Now, this wasn't revealed for the crowds. It was for the disciples and taught for their encouragement in order to assure them that the gospel is never given in vain. God's work cannot be frustrated. There may be a lot of frustrating things that happen as we seek to live a life of obedience and speak to others. And there is. But ultimately, God cannot be frustrated, and His Word, as Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, 11, will not return to Him void. It will, it will perform the work He intended. Just as there is good earth, there are good hearts. They are prepared by God for the gospel. People chosen by God for salvation. I wonder if Paul did not have maybe this parable in mind when he explains his ministry in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. It's the same type of, of, of analogy. It's God's work. 
Th there will be mixed results in the ministry and, and giving the gospel, but God has already prepared the ground before we have gone out into the field to sow seed. So we go with assurance. And that should be encouraging. During the early years of ministry that Spurgeon recounted in his autobiography with the difficulties and disappointments he experienced, he said he found comfort in the doctrine of election. Charles Spurgeon was a great evangelist. He didn't have a conflict with predestination and unconditional election and sovereign grace. He reveled in it. And as a young man, he's a teenager when he's writing this, he wrote a letter to his father. I do want men to be saved, he said, and it is my consolation that a multitude no man can number are by God's immutable decree ordained to eternal life. It's my great comfort, he's saying, that God has predestined souls to be saved. So, he wrote, we cannot labor in vain. We must have some, that is, some souls. The covenant renders that secure. Now, that's sovereign grace. And that is a great encouragement. Still, people are responsible to receive God's word, to believe the gospel. At the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, he told the nation, break up your fallow ground. We all need to do that. Every believer needs to be doing that continually, breaking up the fallow ground that we might receive the Word of God. That truth is important. But how much more important is it for the unbeliever to do that very thing? Break up the fallow ground. Truth is important, and how a person responds to that truth, specifically to the gospel, is serious. It has consequences. Receiving the gospel results in forgiveness and eternal life. Rejecting it results in hardness and damnation. That's serious. If you've not believed the gospel, do so now. Break up your fallow ground by God's grace, open your heart to Christ and receive the gospel. He receives all who do. And may all of us rejoice that by His grace we have, if you've done that, and you will bear fruit as you live in obedience to Him. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for this revelation that the Lord gave to the multitude and that he explained to his disciples and those faithful few around them. And we pray that as we consider it, you'd bless us, that we might be men and women who are more inclined than we might be to give the gospel to those around us and do so in the confidence that you have your people. You've prepared the ground and they will receive it. And your word regardless of the reception that we see, will not return to you void. It always achieves the work that you've intended. So we thank you for that confidence where we can praise you as the God who's in control. It's not up to us, it's up to you. We can plant, we can water, but you give the growth. And we give you praise for that. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the gospel. We thank you for sending him into the world and for the salvation we have in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.